Oh, you made it. You're finally here. Welcome to Half Cocktails, a place where we have a great time celebrating science, the social contract, and just plain old congeniality. Dare I say a place where we seek a path to peace, prosperity, and exploration amongst the stars. What I'm talking about is an all-inclusive society, meaning if you're not on board with the understanding that we all agree to shared rules, norms, and respect, we're not even obligated to consider your opinion any longer because the social contract is that important to a civil society. I'm your friend and host, Dan, the Worship and Dionysus Man, sipping on some science today, welcoming any new listeners just joining us. We're here having a good time. We hope you have a good time, too. Stay tuned until the end of the show. We'll be talking about the one ingredient heart doctors are begging people to add to their pizza. Ooh, I'm having pizza for dinner. I need that one. You need to know. You need to know. Your heart doctor is begging you to know this one ingredient, but you have to wait till the end to find out. I hope I have it on hand. The identity of the of the ingredient will shock you. Is it masturbation? Uh-huh. Whoa! Left turn, left turn. As always, I'm joined by some fascinating guests <laughs> in the lounge today. <laughs> uh, that's Ron, the geologist apologist uh, with the, the masturbation line. Hey, hey Ron, how, how, are you, how are you doing over there? How, how are you doing? <laughs> uh, doing all right. Doing all right. Every, everything okay? Yeah. Um, and ob- obviously, uh, also my lovely sister, Amber, who loves the woo and thinks she's always right, too. Amber, how's your week going? It's going pretty good so far, considering we're only a few hours into it. Oh, well, the week either starts on <laughs> Sunday or ends on Sunday. We got a really fun and informative show for you today, brought to you by Rose Apothecary. Not just a general store, but kind of like a specific store. (laughs) We're going to take a quick look back at the federal government seizing the headquarters of a national retail chain on April 26th, 1944. We've got some hot science news. Uh, We've got the the oldest South Pacific ancient city has been discovered. We've got some uh, self-healing biodegradable plastic that's been developed completely new type of plastic and there's also a new machine that's on the market that you can purchase put just about anywhere on the planet it will pull water out of the air we're going to talk about that uh we got we got some snake oil involving country music legend reba mcintyre oh you're gonna go there i'm going there uh, we got a rousing rendition of Fact Check in Time today. And of course, we'll wrap things up with a, a feel good story that I definitely read before I hit record on this episode. Uh, we're going to encourage <laughs> you to reach out to us at halfcocktails at gmail.com. Maybe you want to send us a text or voice message to 443 499 8253. Maybe just drop a comment on uh, TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, one of those wonderful places. Uh, but for now, we're going to hop in that time machine. Let's go. Nothing would be better than a look at the days of yester in a time machine. So, uh, this was news to me. Apparently, this is a uh, watershed moment in labor relations in the United States. In the 1940s, FDR actually had the National Guard forcibly seize the headquarters of Montgomery Wards, the largest retail chain at the time it would be like uh biden seizing the 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 corporate headquarters of walmart yeah that would be dark brandon time dark branded indeed uh and and i think fdr was was kind of in the right here uh kind of i don't think he was wrong to do it i don't think this was government overreach i think this was uh, something he had to do to keep the war machine going. And that was why why they got away with it, why it's not uh, considered to be a draconian, totalitarian government overreach. It's because legitimately, 1944, we're trying to win the war in Europe and the Pacific. And, uh, well, why don't I just back up and give you the context? So, uh, as we know, World War II, early 40s. Big, big, big shift in all of our industry. Uh, uh, we had to mobilize everything to change from supporting a country and normal capitalist behavior to, hey, all we need, all we are is a, we're a military. That's what we do. That's all we do. That's, that's the military industrial complex that was not 
in place before World War II, we shipped it into it. And so companies like Montgomery Ward, uh, they might have been making dresses or T-shirts, uh, but now they're making uniforms and boots, right? Because, uh, 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 you know, all of our factories had to churn out military equipment. We had to get vehicles. We had to get bullets. Right, like but Ford plants turning out bombers. Exactly, exactly. But all the way down to, like, we need bandages. <laughs> right, the basics. We need canteens so they could drink water. We need meals packaged meals so obviously montgomery ward giant retail behemoth uh became a giant wartime production uh company uh the 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 head leader ceo guy his name was uh, sewell avery uh and he kind of he oversaw that transformation as it shifted that focus from from selling their consumer products to supplying the military so they were making the uniforms, boots, they were making artillery shells, they were making aircraft components, but all of this really strange their wor- workforce. And if you can imagine all of the healthiest, strongest men, they got drafted, they're gone. So the workforce at the time naturally had to consist mainly of women, uh, older men, rural populations. Uh, all got pulled into the, this giant manufacturing apparatus that was World War II. And uh, uh, a lot of marginalized communities weren't e- eligible for military service, get pulled in to work in, in these factories. Uh, grueling hours, unsafe working conditions, uh, wages that were failing to keep pace with the rising cost of living, uh, the cost of goods during a, a giant global conflict like World War II just go up, you know, like we're seeing mm-hmm. now. Mm-hmm. supply chain issues everything gets di- not everything but think so many things get diverted to other areas that would be normally going into to peacetime uh prosperity production right uh, well that's a nice alliteration of- <laughs> that just happened <laughs> you should trademark that yeah <laughs> verbal trademark dan half cocktails <laughs> witness so roosevelt in 1942 establishes the national war labor board uh, and, and that's it was a, a, a government, a, a part of the government that was in charge of like arbitrating disputes between labor and management. So the government can make sure for every all the production continues without interruption. Right. So if you're having problems, your management or your labor, you go to the National War Labor Board. They step in and they say, all right, this is what the decision is. Everybody move forward. End of story. No appeals. This is how it is. Wow. Montgomery Ward and Sewell Avery uh, did not like that. They didn't appreciate that, and they didn't feel like it was legitimate uh, power. It didn't ha- hold legitimate power over them. He's always clashing with them on wage issues, working hours, and even union recognition. He's like, "We don't even recognize that union. Yeah, they're not. They're not here," uh, which is a weird, weird tack to take. But hey, that's where they were at. Uh, so, so no matter how hard the National War Labor Bureau tried to mediate conflicts between Montgomery Ward workers and Montgomery Ward, uh, Montgomery Ward was not changing. They weren't taking the the stuff and 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 accepting it and doing what they were recommending. Um, and Avery was a, Sewell Avery was a very vocal opponent uh, to unions and organized labor, uh, and and he saw government intervention. Uh, totally unwelcome intrusion on his company affairs. He are, you know, typical capitalist arguing regulations, bad it stifles the innovation of Montgomery Ward and its ability to compete. It's so cliche. Innovative what? Clothing? <laughs> if you don't have Montgomery Ward's innovative pricing strategy, yeah. you're not getting good shirts and <laughs> shoes. I mean, I, I remember shopping at Montgomery Wards. In fact, I think I got my very first desktop computer for Montgomery Wards. Really? But I don't remember them being anything particularly special, <laughs> like or like every other store. They they weren't, but they were in the forties. But you know, right. by the nineties, fifty years later, That's true. things had shifted, uh, and they were more, more. They were just a common mall anchor. It was like, oh yeah, Montgomery Wards or Dillard's. I wonder how much of this wartime um, 
tensions in the company like affected their future? It's a really good question. It's a really good question. So tensions between Montgomery Ward and the government were, were increasing uh, as more and more people started to uh, participate in labor strikes and protests uh, at, at various Montgomery Ward facilities because they were working too many hours. They wanted wage increases. They wanted their unions to be recognized. So basically, like a company, if it doesn't recognize the union, it, it won't sit down and negotiate. But if it recognizes the union, then it's, you know, right. it'll sit down. The union rep can say, hey, we need to talk and they'll listen. But by not even recognizing, like, no, we, we don't even recognize you, not let them in the door. They're not even able to negotiate. Kind of like how North Korea doesn't have a seat at the United Nations. Okay. Like, we don't even recognize you. Right. Like. It's it's just shuts them shuts them shuts them out. Um, so it kind of set the stage for this big showdown between Sewell Avery, Montgomery Ward, and and the federal government, which uh, uh, the Roosevelt des- decided to invoke the Smith Connolly Act. Uh, and what was that? Which was what you don't know that at the top of your head. I thought I thought I had it open already. Should all be memorized. <laughs> <laughs> uh, something it's something he had passed the summer before in 1943, a year, a year and a half before. Uh, it was created after uh, 400,000 coal miners had their wages lowered because of wartime inflation. Oh wow! So they weren't getting wage increases while things while inflation happened. And so they went on strike because they wanted a two dollars a day uh, wage increase. And so the Smith Connolly Act, or also called the War Labor Disputes Act, uh, <coughs> me, it allowed the government to seize and operate industries threatened by or uh, or under strike oh. that would interfere with war production. And it it prohibited unions from making contributions in federal elections as well. Yeah, and they had not. Part of <laughs> it's not not a part of the landscape today, right? No, right. Um, so how that switch? They this this first got used when the Fair Employment Practices Commission ordered the Philadelphia Transportation Company to hire uh, uh, black people as as motormen in Philadelphia. Um, there was a labor union uh, in Philadelphia of of transit employees that uh, let a sick out. That became known as the Philadelphia Transit Transit Strike of 1944 for six days, and wow. Roosevelt sent 8,000 uh, army troops to seize and operate the transit system. And Jeez, holy cow! He threatened to he threatened to draft any of the those people that were striking if they didn't get back to work. <laughs> wow. wow! Which did break the strike, and they did go back to work. So Roosevelt wasn't fucking around. Seriously, when he, <laughs> when, when he hey said, man, we're we're at war here. It's you know some some things uh, have to get done. Yes, yeah, it, it's interesting to think about how that all went down and how today's society would react if we had similar situations going on and the government was stepping in in that manner. Like I feel like I don't know. I almost feel like our society has become so self-absorbed that people would be like, "Yeah, we're at war. Who cares?" Yeah, yeah. It, it would. Nobody would blink. Not my problem. Right. Eh, I don't work there. Exactly. <laughs> I don't take the bus. I will tell you if I'm on strike and we're at war, and they're like, "Hey, if you don't get back to work, we're gonna draft your ass." I'm going back to work. Hell yes. Right. I would. That's a pretty good threat. He'd already he already has the Smith Connolly Act in his pocket. Uh, they're still being defiant. Montgomery Ward is, and so he fucking moves in with the troops and U.S. Marshals. Uh, they descended on their main factory in Chicago uh, with orders to seize control of the facility. Uh, and believe it or not, the sight of armed soldiers entering the plant did shen- send shockwaves through the company and the um. broader business community. Um, because this wasn't like like Philadelphia, you know, this wasn't uh, government railway. This was the means of production. Yeah. Well, this is something that never had really been done before, right? So, so this was like shocking that that they would go this far because it hadn't been done before. 
so inside the plant, workers uh, were were working as the army just kind of starts piling in. Wow! Can you imagine? <laughs> you're right. You're, you're just you're making your widgets, you know, in your own zone. <laughs> Are those army guys, or am I still lit from lunch? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Sewell Avery barricaded himself in his office. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, so ma- imagine, imagine the CEO, he's got like the couch and the desk leaned up against the doors so they can't break it in. Oh my gosh. And, and, and they're on the outside and like, sir, we are the federal government and the army and we're here with this court order. Like yeah. you've got to surrender the factory. And he's on the other side, leaning against all his furniture in the door, going, "No, you're not legitimate. Fake news. <laughs> I can live in here forever. I live in here forever. <laughs> you probably had a full stock fridge. I'm gonna poop in a coffee can. It's okay. You're, that paper's not legitimate. The feds can't take over my factory. Sovereign citizen. <laughs> Sovereign citizen. <laughs> Look, your flag has the wrong number of stars, so you can't take this factory over. <laughs> <laughs> it was a highly, highly publicized moment. Uh, they forcibly removed him from his office wow. and uh, carried carried him out to, <laughs> to the paddy wagon. <laughs> Didn't even walk out. They fucking carried him. You've been 86. Badass. Like- once, once they removed him, Right. They didn't waste any time. They took full control over Montgomery Ward. Uh, They put federal managers in place to oversee production, ensure the plant continued to fulfill its obligations to the war effort. Uh, It it was a big move uh, that saying the government is we're not fucking around. We're going to make sure this this. Manufacturing and production part of our of our war effort stays in place. We're making it happen. Wow. So they, they brought they brought in a lot of changes to the workplace. Uh, they, they started working closely with the union reps and the workers to address longstanding grievances and, and improve the conditions. Uh, wages were increased, safety measures implemented, and employee morale turned around. Nice. nice. This is why I know that there is a path in the future that doesn't need capitalism. The moment they took the we own this it's ours individualist out of it and said, no, this is not for you to make profit. This factory is to produce X, Y, Z for the war effort. And then, and then it was like, oh, you're not getting enough to survive. Okay. Now you can have enough. We'll take it out of the profits. Oh, you need safety measures. Okay. We'll spend on that. Right. It's worth it. So it sounds like in the end it was good, right? That's what I'm saying for, for the workers and the country, like, Stepping in and having federal managers actually improved Montgomery Ward, right? Like this whole idea that uh, uh, ser- serving self-serving individualist interests leads to the greatest good is the biggest lie of capitalism that uh, I've ever witnessed in my lifetime, and and it's really it's really sad. I don't know. I think I like I look at today's. Um compilation of national leaders and wonder if that would even be feasible now like if the government could even take over and make things better because i feel like the government is so full of self-serving individuals now that there is no consideration for the greater good in many many cases I, I, I totally agree that uh, our, our government is, is no longer functioning to, to serve the, the best interests of the people. It, our, our government, because of capitalism, has mm-hmm. become uh, uh, its own, its own uh, money machine. Yeah. However, I absolutely also believe that there are plenty of intelligent, good people that would make the right decisions. The, the 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 I think the good in humanity is stronger than the bad. I agree. Uh, it's just we're structured to encourage the bad, and 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 it's a real tragedy. Right, just like those recent studies showing that being a bully in school mm-hmm. makes you a, some more successful. Yeah, I'm yeah. not sure if you read that article, but I yeah, did not. The, the the people that were bullies in school 
actually ended up being higher wage earners as adults. Well, yeah, because they bully everybody on their way to the top. Yeah, being a bully works in our system. Yeah, let's not put that out there. I'm a high school teacher. Let's, let's dial that back a little. Well, no, we need to acknowledge what's happening before in order to address it. It yeah. shouldn't work. And, no, it definitely and when shouldn't. We have, when we have a laundry list of politicians that fail the kindergarten rule of civil conduct, For- what do you expect, right? Our leadership isn't held to those standards. Exactly. So how can we expect everybody else to be held to those standards? That's true. Very, very true. Gosh, and I wonder how we even rein that in, because today's youth see that those things are effective. I mean, there's still some really amazing youth out there that are more socially conscious than I think most adults. Um, But there's still those few that come from families that encourage that kind of competitive, I deserve it, you don't kind of... Mm behavior that leads to the bullying in high school everyone for themselves so i don't know how we how do we flip this how do we fix it or change it or we are always one generation away from change right but huge change takes many generations right as as uh pharaoh what's his name who tried to worship the sun instead of dead pharaohs <laughs> You can have absolute power and say, <laughs> no, the religion is worshiping the sun now. And as soon right. as you die, everybody goes, okay, we're done with that nonsense, yeah. right? Okay, yeah. back, to a, <laughs> right. back to the nonsense of worshiping uh, our past dead right. emperors. Back to the previous nonsense. Yeah, back to the previously scheduled nonsense. <laughs> Make it great again. Yeah, S- speaking of previously scheduled nonsense. Uh, <laughs> so the labor struggles of the 40s that culminated in the government taking over a Montgomery Ward It's still, that shit's still happening today, right? Today, as in the past, workers are still trying to fight against inflation, trying to get fair wages, safe working conditions. We just had Florida be like, no, you can't have mandatory get your ass in the shade, it's too hot laws. Right? That's bullshit. Don't tell me what to do. Don't tell me what to do with my workers. Like, what? If I want to kill them, I can. Right. Truly appalling. And there's so little disregard for human decency. There, there, there is. But we actually have a president like FDR today siding with labor unions and, and promoting yeah. a lot of, lot of labor unions over big business. And that, that make definitely is something that aligns with what I like to see. I agree. Uh, uh, I, I am all for a business being able to make a profit. But sure. we, we have seen a steady, steady shift in uh maximizing the pay at the top and minimizing right. the pay at the bottom yeah yeah because- profits at the at the expense of the people is not sustainable for very long it's really really not it's really really not it's all about appeasing shareholders <sighs> right which is why i don't think our government looks out for us i think too many of them are shareholders in whichever way they can be important stuff and why i love hopping in the time machine but now i think it's time for some news Ooh, yes it's time for some news from our point of view we'd even be glad if we could have a lap or two it's time for the some oldest news. city in the it's south pacific was constructed in Tonga in 380. Oh, wow. I remember that. 1,700-year-old lost city on the island of Tonga Tapu in the Tonga Island chain. Uh, It is 12 miles from a large city today. So I read the article and thought, it's the same city. That's a rounding error on on maps until the 20th century, 21st century. <laughs> right. <laughs> on, a, on a globe, I can't even move my finger 12 miles. Right. 12 miles isn't that much. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, they used LIDAR uh, to, to, uh, to find the mounds uh, and, oh, wow. and actually map out this giant urban structure. Uh, so, so they didn't, you know, societies that didn't have access to a lot of quarries and a lot uh-huh. of rock didn't build stone cities. They built mound cities out of earth, right. you know, clay and adobe right, right. kind of stuff. What they had. So, 
what they had, right? What they could, what they could use. Just like the mound builders in the the central part of the country, Cahokia, right? All those ancient ruins and their connections with Mesoamerica. It's pretty amazing, right? Right. Just like those those people in the, the Americas, like the Tongas. Why would they go? The Tongans. Why would they go uh, to the fucking on a boat? And get bring back bricks when you could just build right. mud domes, right? <laughs> why are you right. gonna Why are you gonna travel two hundred miles to the mountain to get to get rocks? Right. This isn't Egypt where you just float them down the Nile. That's insane, right? It just makes economic sense. Yeah, yeah, it's just fucking economics. Uh, so this 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 new city that they found dates uh, the the old brings back the oldest city seven hundred years older than previously thought uh, pushes it back. So, so what was the previous old sit oldest city Ur? Was that correct? I believe so. Yes. It, the, okay. the, the, the articles I was reading aren't saying specifically, and I didn't do that much research. Uh, and I was putting the, sh- the episode together. <laughs> <laughs> the current capital uh, uh, of Tonga has population density of about 15 people per hectare. The settlement, Apologies. The uh, the ancient city uh, they're calling, uh, forgive me for the bad pronunciation, Mua, Mua, uh, it was six uh, people per hectare. So it was about half as dense as their densest city today, a modern dense so city. Pretty darn dense for a very ancient city. Yes. Wow. Yes. I mean, you're like right on top of each other, right? I mean, obviously, modern people be like, well, they got a big yard. But yeah, for, for ancient peoples, this was clustered together, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I am always fascinated with uh, how industrious uh, ancient peoples can be. And the, the, I, I have like, because, <laughs> because our mother had us watch Steven Spielberg's Jaws <laughs> all the time. <laughs> It was her favorite I grew movie. <laughs> terrified of the ocean, <laughs> so I'm so movie. impressed by by the uh, the Pacific peoples, especially the ones that get on the boats and settle these island chains, and like, oh yeah, we'll we'll just get on a boat for a couple months. I'm sorry, a raft. We're gonna <laughs> sail that way on the we'll just, hope that there's land that way, right? Oh yeah, always, always just Pacific Islanders. Really, really impressive, and and to to find out that they weren't. I mean, we knew that they were obviously around at three hundred eighty, but that, to know that they had a city, not a village, not a town, a city, an urban environment, an urban environment like that's a very successful people, and the fact that it's still populated today. Sorry, twelve miles away isn't far enough. It just yeah. mo- slowly moved over the years. I agree. That's all. People went, oh, you know what? If we went over here, we'd have better water sources, guaranteed. Right. Guaranteed oh, sure. it was water. It's always water. It usually is. Anyway. All right. Uh, you know what else caught uh, my eye when Ron sent it to me? <laughs> <laughs> Scientists have developed uh, a plastic material that's actually self-healing with heat. Wow. And, and on top of that, it biodegrades in the ocean instead of forming a giant Pacific garbage patch. Uh, uh, the they're they're calling it. Uh, it was u- researchers out of uh, University of Tokyo. They're calling it VPR, uh, which uh, it uses an epoxy resin called vitrimer, uh, which is a new type of plastic, and then it, it uh, combines it with uh, uh, another. What was it? Where is it? Ah, uh, this is why I need to take better notes. I thought it was right here. Uh, they they add uh, polyrotaxane. Yeah, they add polyrotaxane molecules into this uh, vitrimer, and uh, uh, it makes a, a a new compound that mm-hmm. not only yeah, like like I said, heals. So like they let's say uh, they make your your plastic case or your phone, and you drop it, and it scratches. Mm-hmm. Like you just apply some heat to it, and it would just go back to its original shape. Wow. Like that's that's my explanation of of the, the what they described. Right. That's pretty amazing stuff. Yeah, could yeah, like like 
I think they were talking about like you imagine a, a road that like got a pothole and you came and just gave it some heat and whoop, back to the road. Although I don't know if you want a road with the stuff if it, it's seawater soluble. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it actually has it has shape memory is mm-hmm. the point, uh, and the the heat can return it to that shape. Uh, and and I guess it's they they've proven partial biodegradability because uh, uh, they only reported. 25% biodegradation de- in weight when submerged in seawater for 30 days. So no no word on, obviously, if it, if it has a total breakdown, because, you know, they, they just invented it. They haven't been able to watch it forever. Wow. But it can be also chemically recycled faster and easier than uh, the typical vitrimer compound. Oh, wow. So as we were just talking about uh, last week, how recycling is snake oil. Only 5 to 10% of what you throw in the recycle bin actually gets recycled. Right. Having plastic that is actually recyclable would be a huge game changer. Yeah. Absolutely. Game changer. We might uh, actually uh, start healing our earth a little bit. Oh my goodness. Uh, with science, it's possible, but we all have to, you know, get together and decide to do it. All right. Decide to stop killing each other. To let go of some greed in order to be more socially conscious the greed for material things and power is is yep. is the root of of so much pain and suffering oh, for sure all over the place yeah yeah uh maybe 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 someday we'll have a a religion that will uh will guide us guide us to the stars i don't know mm-hmm. I'd, I'd love to see it one can only hope and dream <laughs> one can only hope <laughs> All right. Uh, the last story we'll talk about before we get on to some some other fun stuff. Uh, researchers have made a big breakthrough. Researchers, a company now sells a uh, a ground. Uh, sorry, let me back up. A company now sells a device that pulls water out of the air. Uh, it's called the water cube. It's made by a company called Genesis Systems. I'll gladly talk about it, even if it's an ad. If you if you need water somewhere, please buy their product. I don't mm-hmm. I don't get paid anything for it. Um, I know it's an ad, but it's a good ad. Uh, I'm I'm really excited about this. I mean, yeah, this this machine is it's, it's moisture farming. Yes. Yeah. Star Wars style moisture farming. 120 gallons of water a day in almost any climate. Wow. Yeah. That's 120 gallons a day is is more than you need for you and your family. That's 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 a small village, <laughs> right? If you manage your water properly, that's a small village and you know remote arid lands that otherwise um, would be in trouble. That that's pretty amazing. So is that because I don't know a whole lot about the science of this? Um, is that like long term sustainable, or are we going to run out like we do with groundwater that's you know disappearing? Okay, so the machine itself goes for about ten to fifteen years, but pulling water out of the air and putting it into the ground, I don't. I mean, yes, there could be obviously there, there could always be a point where you've you've disrupted the system too far one way or the other, but I really think the danger would be losing water to the outer space. Mm. Right, and I think from the article I read on this topic, it said something like the the moisture that's in the atmosphere, which these devices capture their moisture from, um, contains something like four hundred million times or something crazy like that the amount amounts of water than all the water on the surface of the Earth. Wow! So there's, there's a hell of a lot of moisture in that atmosphere. I'm sure my number's wrong there, but it was a, like a huge number. Yeah. Uh, uh, the fact that it's it, it, so so this machine that can pull this water out of this, you know, uh, uh, just out of the atmosphere, it's the size of an HVAC system. Hmm. Uh, wow. right. I mean, that's totally, totally doable, especially imagine this as like an off grid uh, living solution. Yeah. Yeah. It operates on a 220 volt connection. You get this a solar array. You don't need anything. You're good. Fantastic. You don't need anything. You don't need, and it's it, it costs twenty grand, which is the price of a well in a lot of places. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right? Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And it, and it lasts ten to fifteen years. So absolutely perfect off grid so- solution anywhere. You, anywhere. 
literally anywhere. Boom. Solar and one of these, you've got water and electricity, which means you can live, uh, you can grow things in, in a hydroponics bay if you're in the fucking Arctic. Actually, that's probably the one place. <laughs> right, I think I read that, that the cold, uh, cold <laughs> wet climates are places this doesn't do well in. But, you know, that's, those are not necessarily the places with the highest demand for additional drinking water resources. Yeah, right. yeah. This could really, really help a lot of people. Okay, okay. Uh, before we talk about snake oil today, I, I'd like to take a moment to talk about the amazing gift shop over at halfcockedtails.com slash shop. Have you ever opened up your closet to find it empty time and time again? Walking outside thinking, hey, it's gold. Why hasn't someone invented something to keep me warm? Well, half-cocked scientists have just released a game changer, successfully creating branded t-shirts and hoodies in the half-cocked laboratories. And they didn't stop there. Bucket hats, magnets, canvas wrapped wall art. And I know some people might not want you to put canvas wrapped wall up on your art, on your wall. Ah, this is what happens when you drink too much before you record. <laughs> it's the, the, the dangers of 4 p.m. No, putting uh, the cocktails in half cocktails. Yeah. Uh, they might not like the idea of you putting canvas wrapped wall art up on your wall. And those people are called minimalists. And I say, fuck them. You buy that art. You put it on your wall and you tell them you got it at halfcocktails.com slash shop. Make the world beautiful again. Make the world beautiful once more. Buy our shit. Ah, you know what else is for sale? Not not just our shit. Well, us ourselves. We are also ourselves full, uh, you know, for oh, sale. Definitely. Us. It's capitalism. If you have a job, you're for sale. <laughs> That's for no, sure. No, job, I was, <laughs> was going to say uh, the finest snake oil this side of the Kuiper belt. Oh, <laughs> oil on sale for me. Nothing but snake oil, and it ain't free. Okay, so I teased it earlier. Uh, Reba McIntyre. What? The country music singer. What? I can't believe you're going here. Okay, when you say that, what? First lady of country? Uh, this actually came from a uh, fact check on Snopes. Okay. The claim was country singer Reba McIntyre facing serious charges and asked for prayers regarding a lawsuit involving Fox News and one of its hosts, Martha McCallum. Mm. Uh, it, it was in April 2024, a paid advertisement with a photo of Reba McIntyre uh, was displayed on Facebook claiming she faces these charges, and prayers, yada, yada. Uh, if you clicked the link on Facebook, <coughs> it, excuse me, it took you to an article on a website that looked exactly like the foxnews.com website. Oh. It had the logo, the colors, uh, a byline showed by Britt Hume, the network's chief political analyst. The headline, Reba McIntyre's solution to reverse dementia sparks huge lawsuit pressure on Fox. She finally fought back. That's the headline when you click <laughs> this clickbait. <laughs> so it's, the article said Fox News host Martha McCollum planning on a filing a lawsuit against both McIntyre and the network for violating some sort of contract, supposedly, about Reba nice. McIntyre's creation of products named either Maker's CBD Gummies or Bloom CBD Gummy. Ooh. Uh, well, it was not a genuine Fox News article. <laughs> rest rest, rest assured. Figure. <laughs> you mean there's another one out there? There's I, another one. I do hope that Reba is in the cannabis industry. However, I, I, that would be nice. Oh heck yeah, I'd buy her her stuff. You, you'd buy her CBD gummies? Absolutely. Yeah, right. Well, not CBD. They'd have to have something in them. CBD does nothing for me. We did a story here about uh, CBD doesn't work. Yeah, really does not for me anyway. Sorry, CBD doesn't work for pain. Works for epilepsy, not for pain. A uh, bunch of double blind studies showed that. Anyway, the article on, it was on a scam website. Uh, the domain registrant in in China. It was all bullshit, and uh, they they created the ad in the article, fooling people into believing the CBD was able to reverse dementia. Wow! And and led people to to sign up for monthly subscriptions. Right to their gummy, their CBD gummy products. Wow. 
uh, so yeah, sadly, Reba doesn't do anything with CBD gummies, keto gummies, or similar products. Scammers are using her image and likeness <sighs> to do Scammers. things such as this. They've done. They apparently this scam has been similarly done with Oprah, uh, Kelly Clarkson, Doctor Oz, right? Like that. I mean, Doctor Oz has done his fair share of scamming. So. Well, and I mean, I can see why they choose them because those people do have. They promote shit, right? Yeah, they do promote things that are like health related, and so it, they are targets for the scammers to use. Yeah, if you saw Doctor Oz linked to CBD gummies, you wouldn't think anything right, of it, right? Reading this fact check earlier in the week, I was like, "Oh shit, this is this is snake oil right here." Like, I didn't realize this. For sure. I'm. I get on. I get on Reddit. And and that's about it. Uh, I'm only on the other stuff to share what I'm doing. I'm not on it as a user. I'm a, I'm a drug pusher, not a user uh, uh, for for Facebook. So this was news to me. This this kind of scam I hadn't I hadn't heard about it. But it's kind of brilliant in how uh, they're not liable for their claims because it's a fake news site. Right. right? They in they the they cover their tracks. They tracked it back to China, but it doesn't. That doesn't mean that's where it's from. That just means that's where the VPN led them to, right? Right. Uh, <laughs> I should. I don't. I don't know the process of hiding servers, but I'm sure you can do it. To think, yeah, they, they're not on the line for any of their cl- completely false claims. Like this would be false advertising. If Seriously. If, if I have a CBD company and I claim that it reverses dementia, I can be sued. But these mm-hmm. people, they can't be. What I actually believe, you sh- we should be able to sue. Facebook for allowing the ad. Ooh. Right. Like, that's where we have to stop it. It has to be up to Facebook to have responsible uh, advertising in place. Because they're clearly, they'll let anybody. You mean they can't just sit back and collect money? They have to actually do something? Yeah, be responsible for the content. Like, they see, here's the thing, is they claim we're not responsible for the content users post on our site. And they've hid behind that legal protection forever. Right. But they are responsible for the content they show on their site. And advertising is the content they show. Right. Absolutely. Fucking fuckers. Anyway. Anyway. <laughs> That's our <laughs> snake oil. Uh, let's let's move on. Let's 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 uh, let's hit some, let's hit some fact checking time. Oh no. Here we go. What do you know? It's fact checking time. It's fact checking time. Cross my heart and hope to die. Stick a needle in my eye. Here's the quiz that all the kids call fact checking time. All right, uh, Amber, you weren't here last week, so we got to put you in the hot seat. Yeah. Why do you think I miss? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we got to get on show his wet food. Yes. Yes, that's right. That's right. I love you, Poncho. I will do he my very it. best. It's fact check to check in time. The, the new show's quiz that tests your ability to tell the difference between a news story and something the media has actually deemed worthy of a true fact check. Uh, playing today is, is Amber. You are playing for Poncho Cat, as always. He is the yes. co host. He is the co host of the Half Cocked Tales News Shorts. And whether you win or lose, we'll decide whether he gets wet or dry food for dinner. So, very high stakes. He is not a fan of dry food for dinner. Uh, uh, and, and let me tell you, if you lose, I yeah, also I suffer it. because he Uh-oh. will complain vocally uh, <laughs> by not getting his wet food. So He'll let, let me you assure not. you, I want you to win. I really do. I'm well, now, it. wait a minute. This could change things, seeing as you are my little brother. <laughs> do I <laughs> want you to say, suffer oh. or not? Throw the game. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, okay, uh, and uh, let's get to the game. Let's get to the game. I'm going to present okay, to you a series of events and stories that were in the news this week, but only one of them was fact-checked by a media outlet. These might be articles, they might be social media posts, they might be interview quotes, but only some of them have been fact-checked. Okay, are we ready to begin? Okay, we are ready. All right. Either a woman tried to use her dead uncle to get a bank loan, this is this is completely separate from the man and woman that put their dead roommate in the truck and tried to withdraw the money from his bank account. <laughs> that was so a lot crazy. of weekend in Bernie's this year. A lot yeah. of weekend at Bernie's this year. Uh, it was Bernie's okay, year. So either a woman tried to use her dead uncle at a bank to get a loan, or 
Joe Biden said in a speech that his uncle was eaten by cannibals. Oh, God. Which was fact-checked because both happened. Which one are people going to care to find out if it's true? And which are going to be, which article is going to be just swallowed as truth? Not checked. I'm going to say Biden was fact-checked. Correct. Oh! He said it in a, in a speech in, I think, a, a, near the Philippines. It was overseas. Um, he, his, his uncle in World War II, his plane went down and he made a really, Biden made a really bad joke. Uh, they never found his body probably because he made it to an island and was eaten by cannibals. And people. Can I just say, not, I love yeah. Biden even more now than I did before. <laughs> I really love him much before, but now <laughs> kind of dark humor is what I'm here for. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, the woman, uh, yeah, she took her dead uncle into the bank, like inside the branch. Oh, my not, God. Not to withdraw his People. money, but to get a loan. Now, this is... What? A loan? Oh, people are dumb. Okay. Wow. <laughs> next, next, uh, next round. That's painful to hear. Either an artist sold an invisible sculpture for $18,000 or a company is selling portable invisibility shields. Okay, so I see we have now delved into the emperor's new clothes and no one has learned their lesson yet. God, which one would be fact-checked? I think they're going to fact-check the invisibility cloak because people don't want their money to go to waste generally speaking uh sorry though oh. sadly that was not fact checked the Dang artist it. was fact checked wow did he really send an in- sell an invisible sculpture yes like did that really happen yes okay <laughs> yes that, all right that, i got my side gig Woohoo! all right so, I so invisible sculptures there is a company out there selling actual invisibility shields using uh, modern technology. You can get it over on Kickstarter. Wow. Uh, the Invisibility Shield 2.0. It's not like invisibility where, where you think like the superpower of invisibility, but you can actually have like, go look at the pictures. This guy has the shield and he's standing in front of stuff, but he's taller than the shield, so you can see like his feet and his head. So it's not like Harry Potter's invisibility cloak. Correct. You can tell, okay. a lot of times you can tell there's something there. It's worth taking a look at the pictures they provide of the invisibility shield in in action. Uh, it's impressive. You can tell there's something oh, there. Wow. You definitely can't yes. see the guy behind oh, it. Oh, that is so cool. That's fantastic. No. The uh, the artist was an Italian guy. Uh, he sold a piece called Lo Sono. It's, yeah, sold for 15,000 euros, about 18 grand. Uh, May 18th, 2021, during an art auction. Uh, wow. And and honestly, I think it just highlights the art world's ability to launder money more than anything else. Seriously, that is just ridiculous. The only reason I can think of of buying an invisible visible sculpture for 18 grand is I'm giving this artist 18 grand for his art and he'll give me back 16 grand of washed money. He makes money, mm-hmm. I make, I get clean money. Mhm. Or I run the art house and I keep, I keep the commission, right? It's, it's right. bonkers. Anyway, it all right. Insane. One for one. Last round. This is for all the wet food. Come on. We're, we're rooting for you, Poncho. Oh, God. Come on, Poncho. I got gotcha. you. I promise. Okay. Okay. Either doctors in China held an online circumcision contest <laughs> or Playgirl once ran a sleep with Donald Trump contest. Oh my God. Both. Which was fact checked uh, because both are true. This is a good one. Oh my <laughs> gosh. This is a good one. Darn you. God, like the idea of a circumcision competition. Yeah. Between doctors. Is horrifying. <laughs> I can cut that foreskin better than Absolutely. you. Absolutely. But sleeping with Donald Trump 
believe it or not, is worse. Worse proposition. They're going to fact check Trump. Poncho, you get your wet food. Yay! You got it. Oh, you right. got it. Oh, yeah. you got it You're welcome, uh, Poncho. You can give me kisses next time I come. In 1990, Playgirl <laughs> magazine ran a Sleep with Donald Trump contest in their August 1990 edition. Okay, so so what it actually was, was they were uh, awarding a prize of his new book and a pillowcase with his face on it. Even still, the fact that people would enter for that is just, I don't know, speechless. Just no. There are no words. The contest claimed it picked 25 winners, one for each million of his soon-to-be ex-wife Ivana's prenup agreement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He has to make his money somehow, I guess. Which begs the question, is Melania ready to leave him now that he's selling Bibles? Is that why he's selling Bibles? To make money to pay Melania? <laughs> this might be his MO. I'm just saying. No, no, no clue. No clue. But in China, the doctors actually did hold a online circumcision contest. They did not. They absolutely did. And so what it was, was each doctor recorded their own video of them performing the surgery. And recorded, and then afterwards recorded commentary about what they were doing and and why. And so basically, play by play of the circumcision. Correct. Correct. There's a there, video to pull out at Christmas when Grandma the, comes over. So, so not just anybody <laughs> could access the the video. Like this one. Check this one. This is my favorite. You had to <laughs> either. You had to. Uh, you had to be either a doctor competing, or uh, you you had to. So, so they they had to they had to limit the viewers to serious observers. So you actually had to get credentials to be able to log in and watch. Well, I would hope so. Otherwise, it's a very disturbing new trend in porn. So the fetishists that don't come in, huh? So this <laughs> this is um, something China, they're, something their doctors are trying to do to uh, promote positive sexual attitudes and acceptance of circumcision and uh, correct misconceptions. So it's it's seen as like a stunt where where people aren't, they're not watching it, but they're hearing about it. But circumcision is not necessary in the majority of cases. That's disturbing. I don't know why China wants them to get their dicks cut. I don't know. But they, uh, (laughs) they want to, they wanted these doctors to uh, uh, educate people that because people in China actually believe circumcision boosts their sexual function. Uh, well, yeah, um, there's there's also a, a little bit of a market in a lot of um, uh, medical systems around the world of uh, uh, selling the foreskins to medical companies for skin grafts and things like that. So there is a, uh, a, a monetary. Uh, so therein lies the real reason. Mm-hmm. Where hey, give us some circum, give give us some foreskins here. Right. We need feel good, Dan. Hurry, hurry. Yeah, yeah. Let's, uh, let's. <laughs> <laughs> On that note. <laughs> oh, for a sip. Baby, even a hit. And join us for half. And join us for half. Okay, so a new way has come along to heal broken bones faster. Ooh. And it might actually make them many times stronger. Wow. Up to, that's up to three cool. times stronger. Uh, using plasma irradiation, Japanese okay. scientists uh, have found a way to promote faster bone healing in complex fractures. They successfully tested it in their lab rats. Uh, they found that they not only healed quicker, but the str- strength. Uh, of the areas after radiation was three and a half times stronger than the non-irradiated ones and the strongest ones they found. Uh, huh. Complex fractures are fucking horribly difficult to, to heal from. Let me tell you, because oh, I got absolutely. one in my right ankle as a 15-year-old, that to Oof. this day, ooh, I uh, remember that. If I, that if I wear myself out, that's one of the first places I'll feel it. Right. No, I did not get irradiation. Uh, t- Team of researchers in Osaka 
uh, Japan at the Osaka Metropolitan University <coughs> uh, came came across this. They they uh, one one group of twenty four animals had normal fractures, uh, which are generally easy to heal. Uh, the other group had of 20 had fractures, which are called non-union, which are the, the, the complex ones where healing is usually prolonged or doesn't even complete. Like a lot of these fractures, you know, yeah, oh, it yeah. didn't heal right, so it just hurts the rest of my life. Mm-hmm. Um, the the irradiation didn't offer the normal fracture group any significant advantage. Like if it was just a mm-hmm. clean break, like you don't get an advantage from it. But if it was the, where where we would need it most, that's where it's most effective. That is in, awesome. In those complex ones, yeah, yeah, and stronger. It's it, it's amazing. Uh, so really they were cool. uh, they were irradiating the cells with plasma for five to fifteen seconds, and they they also found that the activity of uh, of a protein that indicates osteoblast differentiation differentiation uh, uh, increased, so that the uh, indicating that uh, the 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 bone forming cells had actually been stimulated into working better. Uh, that it's is amazing. Really, really incredible stuff. And as, as we're watching all this technology that used to be science fiction, you know, literally used to be Dr. McCoy on Star Trek. Oh, you broke your bone? Well, let me let me uh, wave this magic energy wand over it. There you Good go. Good as new. Good as new. Like, uh, well, this is a step on that path right here. We're that seeing would be it. So cool. Right out of Japan. New way to heal broken bones. So now that I would buy that medical device, I will not buy yes. the circumcision trainer that Ron so helpfully just linked in the <laughs> chat. Okay, all I'm saying is, if you're going to circumcise somebody, please buy the trainer first. You know, you, you want to. You don't want to know what you're doing. <laughs> Measure twice, cut once. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. Um, yeah. The, if funny. you follow the link, that's going to be in the episode description. <laughs> the, there's actually a picture of one of the tools they use, and the article does talk about uh, some of the details. Whew. That is really neat, though. No, like, thank you. To, to yeah. be able to heal a bone. Oh, I meant of the circumcision oh, stuff. You don't get any yeah, pictures no, of the I'm, bone. I, I, purposely, <laughs> I purposely was changing the subject. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, and on that note, um, oh, you know, God. We, do, we do have to wrap things up, sadly. Uh, it's been a great time. Uh, I love you guys. You guys are great. Love uh, you. Before, before we leave, uh, I'd like to thank Rose Apothecary, you know, a place where people can come and get coffee or drinks. But it's not a coffee shop, nor no. is it a bar. It's kind of just an environment. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, looks like we don't have any time left for the one ingredient heart doctors are begging people to add to their pizza. And I'm Great. sorry, that's that's on me, folks. I apologize. I'm a windbag. I probably didn't have it anyway. Yeah, yeah you don't have it in your fridge anyway. <laughs> uh, Got to give a, a shout out to science, congeniality, and the social contract, making Woo-hoo! society better than anarchy and civil war. For many of the last thousands of years, uh, any any final thoughts or words before we say goodbye? Well, you know, I hope you all had a, a nice four twenty weekend. I know I did. <laughs> I I am still enjoying my four twenty weekend, and probably will enjoy it every day for I don't know till next four twenty. Every day's four twenty weekend. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Have a wonderful day, folks. If you had a good time with us, you know what to do. Tell somebody that needs to hear us. You can find us yes. over at halfcocktails.com on TikTok, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook. If you're in a giving mood, you can go over and show your support at Patreon or check out all the fine branded merch at halfcocktails.com slash shop. That's right. We'll have all those links in the episode description. Thanks for stopping by. We'll go out and be well. Live long and prosper. There you go. Now things are ending. It's time to go. No more to get through, thanks for listening, that's our show. Ain't affectation, oh, we're just leaving you half cocked, half cocked, half cocked. We had a good time talking today, but even best times eventually they fade away. Ain't adjuration, oh, we're just leaving half cocked.